Hi, Krishna Hi. devotees. Please accept my humble obeisance. It's all good to your proper. Welcome to devotees to today's Bhagavatam class. Today we will be discussing from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 2, Chapter 2, Verse 28. And the chapter is entitled, The Lord in the Heart. We are in the section where the soul, the devotee, is traveling through Satyaloka. And uh, Sukadev Goswami is describing the journey of that soul to Maharaj Parikshit. And we are getting into that part of the, of the uh, discussion now. We're very happy to have His Holiness Chandra Mali Swami with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and Shri Prabhupada Maharaj. Uh, uh, and it's all yours, Maharaj. Thank you, my obeisances to all the devotees. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Tato Vyesam Patipadya Nirbhayas. Anat Napo Nalam Murtir Attava Atbaran. Jyotir Maya Vayum Upetya Kale. Vyavyat manam kam brihat atmalingam. Translation After reaching Satya Loka, the devotee is specifically able to be incorporated fearlessly by the subtle body in an identical, identical identity similar to that of the gross body. And one after another, he gradually attains stages of existence from earthly to watery, fiery, glowing, and airy until he reaches the ethereal stage. Purport. Very long purport. Please listen up. Anyone who can reach Brahmaloka or Satyaloka by dint of spiritual perfection and practice is qualified to attain three different types of perfection. One who has attained a specific planet by dint of pious activities attains places in terms of his comparative pious activities. One who has attained the place of dint by Bharat or Haranyagarabha worship is liberated along with the liberation of Brahma. One who attains the place by dint of devotional service is specifically mentioned here in relationship to how he can penetrate into the different coverings of the universe and thus ultimately disclose his spiritual identity in the absolute atmosphere of supreme existence. Very technical. According to the Srila Jiva Goswami, all the universes are clustered together, up and down, and each and every one of them is separately sevenfold covered. The watery portion is beyond the sevenfold coverings, and each covering is ten times more expansive than the previous covering. The personality of Godhead, who creates all such universes by his breathing period, lies above the clusters of the universe. The water of the causal ocean is differently situated than the covering within the water of the universe. The water that serves as covering for the universe is material, whereas the water of the causal ocean is spiritual. As such, the watery covering mentioned herein is considered to be the false egoistic covering of all living entities and a, in a gradual process of liberation from the material coverings one after another, as mentioned herein is the gradual process of being liberated from the false egoistic conception of the gross material body and then be absorbed in the identification of the subtle body till the attainment of the pure spiritual body in the absolute realm of the kingdom. Srila hmm. Sridhar Swami confirms that a part of material nature after being initiated by the Lord is known as the Mahatattva. A fractional portion of the Mahatattva is called the false ego. A portion of the ego is the vibration of sound and the portion of sound is the atmospheric air. A portion of the airy atmosphere is turned into forms. 
and the forms constitute the power of electricity or heat. Heat produces the smell of the aroma of the earth, and the gross earth is produced by such aroma. And all these combined together constitute the cosmic phenomena. The extent of the cosmic phenomena is calculated to be diametrically, that is, both ways, 4 billion miles. Then the covering of the universe begin. The first strat stratum of the covering is calculated to extend 80 million miles, and the subsequent coverings of the universe are respectively of fire, effulgence, air, and ether, one after another, each extending 10 times further than the previous. The fearless devotee of the Lord penetrates each one of them and ultimately reaches the absolute atmosphere where everything is, is of one and the same spiritual identity. Then the devotee answers one of the Vaikuntha planets where he assumes exactly the same form as the Lord and engages in the loving transcendental service of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of devotional life. Beyond this, there is nothing to be desired or achieved by the perfect yogi. Om Gyan Timirandas Yagyana Jana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam dadati swam padanti kam. Bande hum shiguro si utapa de kamalam shigurun vaishnavams chasi rupam sagujatam sahagana ragana tam hum patam tam sajivam. Sadvaitam sarvadutam parijana sahitam krishna chaitanya devam sri radha krishna padam sahagana lalita sri vishakam vitams cha. A Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Dapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Swari Vrishavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vansha Kalpa Tarubhisya Kripa Sindhu Pae Bacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nithananda Sri Advaita Gadar Har Sivasari Gauda Vakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaunda Vani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Paschatya De Sitarine. Now hmm. so here we're hearing about the perfect yogi who perfects the yoga system, the Astanga yoga system. We have read from the previous verses all of the different levels of practice, and now the yogi has reached the perfect stage and how he transfers himself from the material realm through the different coverings beyond the cause of the ocean into the Brahma Jyoti and ultimately reaches the Vaikuntha planets. This yoga system is described and Krishna mentions it in Bhagavad Gita also. And he also says it's very difficult to achieve because everything has to be done perfectly if there is some slight deviation in the process. And the whole process is a failure. <laughs> and uh, But here, Sukadeva Goswami takes a whole section of the Bhagavatam to explain this process because it is the process that was recommended in previous ages. <laughs> Not in this particular age we live in. This particular process is very possible because people in this age are manna sumanda mateo manya bhaga upadrutaha kalena sabda usge yusmin 
Manda sumanda matiyo, people are lazy, unlucky, not very inclined to spiritual life. And even if they are, they get cheated. So in this age, people are not qualified to perform this particular process of yoga system, which is authorized, but at the same time, not possible because of the effects of Kali Yuga and because of the, what we say, deficient qualities that people have in this age, people are not qualified. They cannot do it because the age has deteriorated all good qualities. Memory, physical strength, mercy, longevity of life, compassion, all of these things have been qualified, what's the word? Uh, greatly de reduced in this age of Kali, very difficult. So although it's right, mentioned here and it's an authorized process, you can see how, what it means to become a perfect yogi. <laughs> and that's the Astanga yoga system. Yama, Nimama, Atyahara, Pranayama, Asana, uh, uh, Dhyana, Dhyana, Dharana, and then ultimately Samadhi. Reaching the stage of Samadhi, one can focus their consciousness on the goal and then through that through the power of their yoga yoga system they can project the soul out of the material body into this within the subtle body you can see how the subtle body reaches up to the brahma loka but then it moves out of that goes into a less and less finer aspect until it enters into the vaikuntha realm and reaches the uh, the lotus feet of the Lord in Vaikuntha. <clears throat> but here, although it's very amazing to hear, and also very uh, complex in the way it is performed, still it is somehow uh, rejected in this age <clears throat> because of the age of Kali. But the benefit has come that one can achieve not only the benefits of the yoga system in this age, but even going beyond Vaikuntha into the realm of Vrindavan through the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Sankirtan movement. Therefore, the Sankirtan movement, as given by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, along with the teachings that he gave and execute the process of bhakti, in this age, which is the teachings given by Srila Rupa Goswami and Bhakti Rasamatu Sindhu, and also delineated even finer in uh, Upadesh Amrita, Nectar of Devotion and ultimately Nectar of Instructions, and of course Srila Prabhupada's teachings in Srimad Bhagavatam along with Krishna's direction in Bhagavad Gita, all of that is there. If one adheres carefully to the process as given and engages in Harinam Sankirtan, as Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, the process cannot be perfected in this age without Harinam Sankirtan. So Harinam Sankirtan is the essence of Lord Chaitanya's teachings and the means for raising the consciousness through the different levels of perfection up to the stage of pure devotional service. So the chanting of the holy name, both Japa and Kirtan, is the essence and the perfection of the the uh, the uh, process of devotional service in this age. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has made it quite easy comparatively. You can just simply he, see he See here how difficult and how complex and how exact this process is. But even in, but Lord Chaitanya has even allowed Kiratu Hunam Palinda Pukasaram Birasam Baba Yavan Kashadya Nijaye Jarasam Upasrayasraya Sudanti Pavavishnavena Maha. He says, anyone 
no matter where they're from, no matter what qualifications or disqualifications they may have, if they engage in serving the, the message of Lord Chaitanya through the Sankirtan movement, can eventually purify themselves and reach the stage of perfection. And then ultimately achieve the benefit of going back home, back to Godhead. And one doesn't have to traverse all of the different realms of existence as described here. When one reaches that stage of perfection and simply within instantaneously, the soul is transported from the realm of this material level all back to the spiritual it is instantaneous, Prabhupada says. It's like, how, how has he described it? It's like a flash of lightning. One minute or one second before the flash, you're in the material world. When the flash comes, you're in the spiritual world. That is Lord Chaitanya's mercy. But we have to, we have to practice this process of Krishna consciousness very continuously. If we are attached to anything in this material world, we cannot fully engage in the devotional service of Lord Chaitanya. Therefore, he, Lord Chaitanya's movement is Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga. It is the process of renouncing all desires for material benefit or happiness in this material world and engaging oneself fully in devotional service to the Lord. That full, that full devotional service is very easily performed as one works under the guidance of the spiritual master, takes the instructions of the spiritual master as their life and soul and applies them and centers their activities around pleasing the Lord through the instructions given by the spiritual master. But the essence of that is to chant the holy names of the Lord and to perfect one's consciousness through the process of chanting. Chanting has different stages of development. The first stage when we begin chanting, and this is, this is characteristic by everyone, is that uh, people are chanting with offense. There are not 10 offenses to the holy name of the Lord. In many temples around the world, practically all temples around the world, during the morning program, we recite those 10 offenses just to remind us what we have to avoid. As long as we're chanting with offense, the process of purification is practically stopped. It's the, You're getting freedom from material suffering, but you're not getting purification of the heart. And one has to very carefully observe or avoid those 10 offenses and focus on the activities of devotional service. And then if therefore purify their chanting. As the chanting becomes purified, we reach the stage of offenseless chanting. That is called Namabas. That's the second stage. That's like a glimmer of the holy name starting to come. The, the, the example is just like in a cloudful sky, there may be a little break in the clouds. And because of that break, the, the light of the sun comes through that break and that ray comes out and one can see that, that sunlight, but they can't see the sun. So this is compared to the beginning of one's success in Krishna consciousness, a little ray of that pure sun of the holy name. The holy name is so powerful that it's Krishna himself in transcendental sound. The holy name of Krishna is Krishna. It is non-different than Krishna. There is no um, there is no slight, even slight difference between Krishna and his holy name. In fact, Krishna's holy name is even more merciful than Krishna because by chanting the holy name, one can free themselves from offenses committed against Krishna or committed against Krishna's devotees. So by chanting the holy name, one can purify themselves, but we have to chant free from offenses. Therefore, every day, it is very, uh, what we say, encouraged that devotees remember those 10 offenses and somehow avoid them. The first offense is to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives to the propagation of the holy name of the Lord. 
The second fence is to consider demigods, very powerful demigods like Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva, to be equal to or independent of Lord Vishnu, Krishna Vishnu. The third is to disobey the instructions of the spiritual master or to consider the, the spiritual master to be an ordinary person. The fourth is to blaspheme Vedic literatures or literatures in pursuance of the Vedic version. The fifth is to uh, give some interpretation on the holy names of the Lord. The sixth is think, to think that the, the holy name of the Lord is imaginary. The seventh is to commit sinful activities on the strength of the holy name. The eighth is to consider the ritualistic activities that are mentioned in the Vedas, such as karma kanda, to be equal to the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Nine, to instruct the faithless about chanting of the holy name. And tenth is to, uh, is to still be attached to material happiness and material success while chanting the holy names of the Lord. And of course, we add one tenth offense, that is the eleventh offense, which is inattentive chanting. So these 10 offenses, each one requires an explanation, and we'll get into some of them. To criticize, blaspheme, or find fault with devotees who have dedicated their lives to expand the glories of the holy name through the process of preaching. To find fault with them, to criticize to them, to blaspheme them, to, to consider them to be uh, even though they may have some external fault that's not important, still they have dedicated their lives to the propagation of the holy name. The scriptures mention Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. Brahma is the creator, Vishnu is the maintainer, and Shiva is the destroyer. All three are managing the material energy. But Vishnu is above Brahma and Shiva, because he is the supreme personality of God. The devas, such as Brahma and Shiva, are expansions of the supreme personality of Godhead for the function of material energy, for the creative function and the destruction function. To consider the, to, uh, consider the instructions of the spiritual master as optional, I'll, I'll well, I like these instructions. I don't like these instructions. I'll follow these. I can't follow these. I won't follow these. Or, or the spiritual master, he comes from, yeah, I know him. He used to be in my neighborhood when he was growing up. We were friends together. Now he's he's in this big post as spiritual leader. Yeah, he's, you know, he's just like me, but maybe a little bit more advanced. <laughs> Uh, the fourth offense is to find fault with other scriptures, not realizing that all scriptures have a place within human society because all scriptures actually teach people according to the level of practice that they are they're, uh, engaged in. So there's, there's scriptures for people in the mode of ignorance. There's scriptures for the people in the mode of passion. There's scriptures for people in the mode of goodness, and there's scriptures that are transcendental to the all three modes. So to find fault with these lesser scriptures mm, that are meant to elevate people from a lower mode to a higher mode, and eventually get them to the highest principle of devotional service. To find fault with these scriptures, sometimes uh, these scriptures are other religions, then that's also a offense to the holy name. To consider the chanting of Hare Krishna as imagination. Yes, the scriptures say so many wonderful things about the holy name, but yes, we know these are just exaggerations. They're just hyperboles. These are just ways to get you to chant. It's not like that. In other words, uh, the glories of the holy name are seen to be some kind of uh, over emphasis of the actual holy name itself. But actually, it's the other way around. The glories of the holy name are only, en uh, they, they, are, they cannot be emphasized in scriptures. It's not possible. So all of the glories are really an underestimation, not an overestimation. 
But the one who thinks that they're imaginary, that's an offense. To give some interpretation of the holy name, to compare the holy name to something material, just like, you know, I might go out for a nice swim and get refreshed and my body is energized, I feel happy. And so, you know, chanting of the holy name is like a refreshing bath in the ocean. Or the chanting of the holy name is like um, anything you want to compare it to in the material world and, and make an interpretation based on that comparison. This is also considered the offense. The holy name is Krishna himself. It has nothing to do with or connected with anything in the material world. The seventh offense is, well, I have uh, I know the formula. I'll go out and have a little illicit sex, some intoxication. Tonight I'll come back, I'll sit down and I'll chant the holy name and I'll get free from the reactions of my sinful activities. This is called Nam Nam Bala He Papa Bhuti. This is one of the most serious offenses. To use the holy name to somehow or other try to get free from the reactions of offenses. If one commits some offenses or sinful activities accidentally or by means of one's uh, tendency. In other words, it happens because we might be in we have that tendency still yet. That's fine. But if one purposely, just like I'll smoke a little bit of marijuana, I'll do, uh, you know, I'll do a little illicit activity here and there, and then the holy name is so powerful it'll get me no uh, the holy name will not work in fact the holy name will beat that person back and the holy name will cause that person to uh, fall down from krishna consciousness <laughs> the eighth is there are yoga there's homas there's ratas there's pujas the vedas yagya veda the uh uh, Samaveda, they have so many uh, listings of various types of pujas that can be performed in order to get some material benefit. To think that the holy name is equal to all of these is no different because they're all part of the Vedas. That's another offense. The holy name is Krishna himself. It sounds... These other processes, again, are for elevation or for some material benefit. The ninth offense is to, uh, when preaching the glories of the holy name, people, one may come in contact with people who are resistant, don't want to hear. And if we, we push it upon them, then they, uh, they may also blaspheme the holy name. And it is not good for them. It is not good for the person who is doing that as an offense. Sometimes in a in a assembly of people, we speak a little bit about the glories of the holy name. And uh, there are people there who are resistant. We don't even know about that. But that cannot be avoided. But we should be very careful not to get into the higher aspects of the benefits of the chanting of the holy name such as this Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan in a general assembly of people. The last one is to, um, after hearing so many instructions on, on the holy name year after year and practicing Krishna conscious, I'm still attached to this material world. I'm still attached to my sense gratification. I'm still looking towards material energy for, for happiness. I'm still somewhat busy making plans to enjoy in this material world. Now that is considered the tenth offense. That is called the I, me, and mind principle based on the body. And of course, the chanting of the holy name must be done attentively. There are three forms of inattention, one is called Aldakshin, another one's called Vigshepa, the other one's called Jadya. Aldakshin means I'm chanting, but you know, I'm kind of like laxadaisically chanting. I break my chanting and maybe I'll check my cell phone and see see what messages I got. Or I'm looking out the window and see what's what's happening outside. Or I'm just, you know, I just can't wait till it's over. 
I'm counting the numbers as I'm chanting. And I'm more, in other words, laziness, a type of uh, inertia, a type of uh, uninterest in chanting the holy name. I'm doing it because I have to do it as part of the instructions of my spiritual master. So that's offensive. And then uh, uh, vikshepa means uh, my mind is full of plans and ideas while I'm chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And I'm making, I'm, I'm focusing on these plans and ideas as I'm chanting in order to make my plans to fulfill my desires later. Or I'm just uh, spaced out and I'm not really focusing on hearing very nicely. I'm simply, my mind is wandering here and there and I'm not doing anything to bring it back to the sound of the holy name. And Jadya, Jadya, it means I'm chanting, but I'm sleepy. I didn't get enough rest the night before or the night before I had a big feast and now I'm trying to chant and the next morning I'm still digesting the feast and I'm, I'm half awake, half asleep. I try to chant. All right, then Bhakti Vinoda, of course, says walk around so you can stay awake. But then even walking around, I can't even concentrate on it. I'm still feeling tired and sleepy and spaced out. So one continues to chant like that as a defense. Bhakti Vinoda, of course, says make some adjustments so you can come back to attentive chanting. But if you can't, take some rest and then chant when you are in a rested state of consciousness it's it's easy to do things not easy but it's normal to do things when you're tired it's it's normal to do things you can even give classes when you're tired you can even speak the philosophy when you're tired but when it comes to chanting tiredness and sleepiness really interferes with the quality of our chanting so one should be very much alert and make plans the night before to be fresh in the morning to, to approach the holy name with clarity and full wakefulness. Okay, these are the 10 offenses plus the 11th. One should avoid these 10 offenses and chant the holy names of the Lord and follow the process as given by Srila Prabhupada and his his representatives, the presence of charyas, and which is the process in this age as recommended in the Vedas. And Srimad Bhagavatam illustrates that this process is the perfection of yoga. The perfection of yoga in this age is to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hurry, hurry. Thank you for such a wonderful class, Marge, and bringing us back to the foundation of our Krishna consciousness of devotional practice, and that is chanting of the holy name. I'm going to ask Prikshit to stop sharing and would like to request devotees if you can turn on your video wherever you're at, and um, if possible depending on your situation. And if also, if devotees have any questions, any clarification, any doubts, please do raise your hand and I will be happy to answer a, a call upon you or you can put it in the chat and I will you know, be glad to read it for you. Maraj, when you were speaking, when you were reading the purport, it definitely sounds like a very long journey. <laughs> Such a long journey. Marge, so does that mean, Marge, that because by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, just to just for my mind, that um, he has made it easy for us in a sense that we don't have to go through that long journey? We can't do it. <laughs> you try it, see if you see what happens. <laughs> just reading it was enough, Marge, to try <laughs> I got <laughs> I mean, if you read the preceding verses, it tells you what you have to do. Yeah, yeah. So this verse culminates with the perfection of achieving all of the preceding verses. Yeah. And it's, you know, one has to, you know, secluded place, blocking the... Uh, 
blocking the rectum with the with the foot with the heel of one's foot, practicing the breathing process, all of these things. I am so happy that Lord Chaitanya really saw how foolish or crazy we would be that we can't do any of those. It's just in, in, intense. Wow. This is Kali Yuga. And this is Lord Chaitanya only comes once in every 1,000 Kali Yugas. So all of the other Kali Yugas don't have that mercy. Mm -hmm. They must follow this other process to attain perfection. Maharaj, if devotees if you have a question, please raise your hand because um, I can stop talking and then call upon you. Marge, because Kali Yuga, you know, Lord Chaitanya has been so merciful to give us, quote unquote, the easy way out. If we see and take advantage of how simple he has made it for us, compared to the other Yugas, Maharaj, why is the mind such a rascal that we don't appreciate how easy it is? <laughs> Because another, of all the offenses, I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure why is this mind such a rascal? Another name for mind is rascal. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Bhakti Siddhanta kind of summed it up in one statement. He says, your mind is a non-devotee. <laughs> you have to direct that mind towards Krishna and devotional service and keep it in that in that direction. It'll jump back, it'll run away, it'll go some, it'll complain. It'll do whatever it can to, to do what it wants <laughs> until it gets to the stage of somewhat freedom from material desires. Then you can start controlling. As long as you still have material desires, it's very difficult to control the mind. And the material desires, Marge, can be anything, right? Whether it be job, home, what I want, how I want to enjoy, it can be anything. Yes. Just... Material desires are numerous and they're also very complex. There's subtle material desires and there's gross material desires. They're like a material desire is... Uh, I do something and I want some benefit from that activity. That's mm. a material, that's, that's tin, putting a tinge or a taint on the devotional activity. Looking for some remuneration, some benefit. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati gave one example where one of his preachers went out one of his leading sannyas preachers. He went out and did a program. And he was one of the best of all preachers. Thousands of people came to the program. And he gave such a powerful lecture that he got a standing ovation after. Mm. It was you know, it was glorious. I mean and then he came back to the ashram that same evening and he wanted some special prashadam that night. <laughs> because he felt like he deserved it. <laughs> mm. he said that immediately recognized. He says, "Well, what? Who does he think he's? He thinks that he's the doer. <laughs> he thinks that he needs to get rewarded for his activities." You might say that's such a small thing, but Bhakti Siddhanta could show that was a, a taint, some tinge there. If someone would have offered him some special prashadam, that would have been fine. But he asked for it. He was looking for something. He wanted, he felt like he should get something special. <laughs> wow. Interesting, Marge. How it, it how it, how, how this, I'm how, sorry, Marge, please go ahead. How subtle it is, yeah. Yes, yes, that was, yes, it's so subtle, yet at the same time, so unrecognizable. And, and I think much that is the 
challenge, you know, that we go through, that it's so subtle, so, 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 so subtle that we can't recognize it. And because we can't recognize it, Marge, we repeat that same thing over and over again. Then what happens, Marge? Who's, you know, when, when will I, you know, be able to recognize that subtle yet deep-rooted desire and pluck it out? Will it be just, you know, will, will, will it be me just figuring it out? Or is, is it going to take someone to slap me? Like, because it, it just gets repeated. We don't, I don't know. Yeah, we should be very conscious of well, what is my motivation? Am I doing this to please Krishna and to further the religious principles? Or am I doing it to gain something? Of course, there is a gain. Bhakti Siddhanta also makes that point that, I'm, I'm sorry, Bhakti Vinod Thakur makes that point that wherever there is a there is a desire, wherever there's an activity, there's a desire for something. Our desire should be for purification of the heart, for elevation to you know, a higher stage of, of understanding. We shouldn't be trying to gain something from the material energy based on that. Krishna may reciprocate with a devotee by giving them something that appears to be material, but that's just Krishna's way of reciprocating the devotee. He does that just to uh, reward his devotee or to congratulate his devotee. He reciprocates sometimes like that. But that's Krishna. But when we seek these things as a motivation behind the activities we perform, to recognize these things, one can sometimes see it. That's why the association of devotees are so important, because in the association of devotees, it's more easily recognizable our anarthas. <laughs> Much easier. When we're alone, it's very difficult to recognize them. Mm. So, Marge, I devotees, like I said, you can jump right in, <laughs> raise your hand, and I will stop talking. Seriously. Marge, because you just said that it takes devotee associate. Okay, good. Bhagishri, go ahead. I'll stop talking. Ask your question, please, Mother. Hare Krishna, Dandar Pranam Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, Maharaj, like uh, you mentioned, uh, in every Kali Yuga, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doesn't come. So, uh, as we know that the Yuga Dharma of Kali Yuga is Sankirtan. So then, how this Sankirtan movement is carried out in other Kali Yugas? No, it's not. Um... The chanting of the holy name is there, but it's not the Yuga Dharma. Again, the chanting of the holy name has always been there since the beginning of time. And people in previous ages also used to chant, but that wasn't the means for self-realization. If, if you see, each of the Yugas have a particular Yuga Dharma or means for self-realization. And... Uh, in such a yuga, it is the meditation, the process where we were just hearing from in the Bhagavatam, the Astanga Yoga system. Uh, in Treta Yuga, it's costly Vedic sacrifices, Agnihotra. In the Dvorpa Yuga, it's wor deity worship. Deity worship was the Yuga Dharma in deity worship, in, uh, in Dvorpa Yuga. And uh, when Lord Chaitanya doesn't come, there is an incarnation in that age called Gor, Gor Narayan. There is a place, it's a golden Narayan form, and he teaches the process of reaching the Vaikuntha realm. Vrindavan is not available. Only by Lord Chaitanya's mercy is Vrindavan available. Mm -hmm. So this is the process given by the Lord. Oh, okay, Maharaj. So this Gaur Narayan is a form of the uh, Vishnu Tattva? Yeah. Well, Narayan, the, the Narayan forms are in the spiritual world. They're in the Vaikuntha realm. 
Um, okay, Maharaj. So, where we can find the references for this? Hmm? Is it mentioned in Bhagavatam? Um, it's mentioned, yeah, not very extensively. I've heard it from senior devotees also. Uh, if you look at the cantos, uh, you'll see the 11th canto and the 12th canto. Both talk about the quality, the, the characteristics of the age of Kali. So in the 12th canto is mostly the characteristics of the age of Kali in the uh, in the other 999 yugas or Kali yugas. But in the 11th canto is more of the age of the characteristics of the age of quality are mentioned in the 11th canto or more when Lord Chaitanya comes like that. So anyway, uh, um, we are fortunate because Krishna comes once in 1,000 yuga cycles. And after Krishna's appearance, then Kali Yuga, uh, when Krishna disappears, that's the end of that Dwapara Yuga. Kali Yuga begins, and when Kali Yuga starts, after 5,000 years within Kali Yuga, then Lord Chaitanya comes once in every thousand yuga cycles. Even Krishna comes once in every thousand yuga cycles. He doesn't come in every Tapura Yuga either. Now get out of this material world. It's not so easy. <laughs> but consider yourself to be sup supremely benefited by the presence of Lord Chaitanya. If we don't take advantage of this and we have to come back, we might have to wait for another millions of years again before we can get a chance to get out. Very nice question, so Mother. Hard. That's why <laughs> Namo Mahavadanaya Krishna Prema Padayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namani Gauda Triste Namaha those who know about Lord Chaitanya will simply become, they will faint in ecstasy just thinking about how mercifully he is. It's not possible to understand Lord Chaitanya, his mercy. Not possible. He is so merciful. <laughs> it's cut through all of the difficulties that are normally there for one to reach perfection and made it Harinam Sankirtan. But we have to take this Harinam Sankirtan seriously. We shouldn't simply do it as a side event along with our material life. It has to be first. <laughs> That's why devotees can throw everything away and simply engage in Harinam Sankirtan. We have devotees who do Harinam Sankirtan all the time. That's all they do. <laughs> they simply chant. And of course, they do services, other services too. Whether you're in Grihe Taco, Bane Taco, Sabda Hari Boli Daco, whether you're Grihasta, Manaprast, Sanyas, Brahmachari, or anywhere, you can become perfect through the through Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement. Thank you so much. Chant, chant Kirchan, chant Japa, both. Not just one, both. Take every opportunity to engage in Kirtan and chant your rounds every day as the most important aspect of your of your day. It is. <laughs> we, the, the qualifications for success is to prioritize our spiritual life above everything else. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances on Guru Station of Prabhupada and me. Maharaj, um, it is mentioned in one of the scriptures that Iskon won't be followed after 1,000 years. So what what is the reason behind that? Why won't it be followed? Where does it say that? I, ne I never heard that. 
ISKCON will not be followed after 1,000 years. The Sankar, Lord Chaitanya has predicted Priti Vityachi Agan Aganagri Gram. What is the rest of that verse, Sudevi? Sarvatra Prachar Hoibe Mura Nam. Yeah. In every talent village, mind the holy name of the Lord will be chanted. Lord Chaitanya has predicted that the whole world will become Krishna conscious or God conscious, you might say. And it's going, it's happening now. It's going up, it goes up, it goes down, it goes this way, it's going down. Papa said, if you don't do it, the next generation will do it. And if the next generation don't do it, the next generation will do it. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya will make sure that the whole world will become Vaikuntha. Five thousand years up, five thousand years down. For the next four thousand five hundred years, it'll continue to increase. When it reaches perfection after five thousand years, then because the material energy is still there, it'll stum and then somehow by the arrangement of Maya then the Sankirtan movement will start to decrease and go down and back down. So for the next 5,000 years, you got a chance to perfect your life. <laughs> Whether it's ISKCON or the Hare Krishna movement, <laughs> sometimes they say it's two different things, but that's another discussion. <laughs> In other words, the chanting is what we have. We have to follow the process too. You can't just chant and say, well, "That's all I need to do." The chanting gets purified through the process of deity worship, which helps to develop the qualities of a Vaishnava, which allows one to chant in such a way that their chanting is is bringing them closer and closer to the stage of perfection. We can chant for 1,000 lifetimes if we're chanting with a fence, and we won't get the benefit of the chanting. We must carefully follow the processes given by Srimad Bhagavatam, especially Rupa Goswami in the Nectar of Devotion. The, the science of bhakti is given. It's not so difficult to follow. All one has to do is follow the instructions of their spiritual master. And whenever they have difficulties, find out, understand the difficulties, find the solutions, and then move forward in Krishna consciousness. Thank you, Maharaj. Always remain positive. Don't waste time. <laughs> You're young, uh, uh, Madhvi, but still, you know, uh, it's never too, you, you, you can take up the process of Krishna consciousness at any age, and the sooner the better. <laughs> some, of, some of us old folks who joined later in life, we find it difficult. They say it's very difficult to teach new tricks to old dogs, you know. <laughs> Many of us are old dogs, and we're still, you know, we're still stuck in our doghouse. <laughs> the trainer is outside saying, come out of your doghouse. I'll teach you some new ways to become a nice dog. But <laughs> we're st well, all we do is bark at the trainer. <laughs> so get out of the doghouse. <laughs> she Dave is really cracking up. Huh? Sri Devi is really cracking up, Maharaj. <laughs> yes, she's very transcendental. Hari <laughs> Hari <laughs> Very nice question, Bhagashri. And um, Madhavi, I think your name is, right? Small. Pavani, sorry, sorry. Maharaj, there's a very nice question here by Raghav Pandit. And he said, Hi, Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All Krishna Show Prabhupada. You mentioned that when devotees are in isolation, they can become accustomed to causing offenses. 
When well, we see devotees in the situation, how can we help them without being accused of Vaishnav Aparat, especially as they see themselves as senior devotees and their actions should not be questioned? I hope that makes sense. Well, uh, you can, you, there's different ways you can try to make a difference. Inviting them to programs, bringing them prasadam, taking some time to talk to them. If you try to preach to people like that, generally they, they become somewhat blocked. They won't listen because they have their own ideas. Just like you know, sometimes people in married life, after so many years, they start fighting and they start calling each other names and it gets kind of kind of kind of kind of uh, uh, pretty heavy sometimes. And then you might say, well, what will you do in that case? There's many things you could do, but one of the things you could, you can remind them what it was like when they first met each other and when they first got married. What was that love? What was that attraction? So we remind people what it was like when they first joined and how much, the, how enthusiastic they were in the process of devotional service and how much they... And that's still there. Krishna consciousness doesn't deteriorate with time. It remains ever fresh. That's why Krishna is called Nava Yovana. It's always ever fresh. Time doesn't wear down the effects of Krishna consciousness. That was a very nice question that he asked because... um. I was about to ask a similar question like that, Mara, just that um, we, earlier on, you were mentioning that it, it takes devotee association. It takes, you know, being around devotees to really see the really deep-rooted, subtle, um, uh, you know, weeds in our hearts and our minds because, because they're unrecognizable. But Maharaj, in the old quote unquote, in the oldest gone days, you know, we all live closely together. We go to the temple every day, you know, that whole um, uh, spiritual boot camp, as I call it, doesn't exist now because everything is, you know, far once a week, whatever. And when, when I look back, Marge, how it used to be then and now, it's a big difference because then Every day we are in the association of devotees in the temple, chanting, hearing, dancing, and we get recognize our roots, our, our you know our subtle roots. But now it's very difficult because we we just come once a week. So, what are the chances, Maharaj, of actually recognizing and uprooting those real deep subtle stuff? <laughs> Because everything is Zoom, but even Zoom, you know, that 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 personal association, that talking and sharing and openness, it's not there the way it used to be 20 years ago or 10 years ago, at least for me. Uh, yeah, when was the last time you went traveling? <laughs> me? Um, October, geez, last year for three days to Houston. It was beautiful. Yeah, there you go. If you go around the world, you'll see... What you're talking about is not necessarily the norm. Mm. There's places all around the world that are quite dynamic. And there's still, the, the ashram life is still there. <clears throat> Brahmacharis. There's also a revival. There's this program now to revive the, the, the ashram life again. It's called Krishna House. It's spreading all over. <laughs> that, I think, is awesome, Maharaj. Yeah. We fell away from the essence of our Krishna consciousness by putting too much time and energy on management and fundraising rather than on preaching and on Harinam. And because when we got into the fundraising thing, we stopped doing uh, the essence of what Srila Prabhupada taught us. 
we were always thinking about raising money, seeing people who come to our temple as objects of donations rather than opportunities to make them Krishna conscious. So true, Maharaj. So true. So true. And I think, Maharaj, what I've also noticed is that that heart-to-heart -heart connection has been replaced, you know, with, like you mentioned, fundraising and management that, that yeah, that community building really cracking, you know, I'm, I'm trying to use Bhaktatul Swami's language here, really trying to crack the hospital for the heart and really opening up you know, and, and building strong relationships. Right. It it is I, I feel it isn't so is it's not strong because um and I think it's the, it's the distance because we just see each other once a week at the temple for Sunday program and that's it. There's not much after that. And and well, it is hard well, to really come together again and really weed out our stuff that's really deep in our hearts, you know, and speak about it. I can't really agree with you on the idea that this is okay. where it is all over in some places. Oh, no, no, Marge. Absolutely not. It's not all over. I agree. No, it's not. Hmm. Certain, yeah. yeah. It's, it's definitely not all over. I agree. Yes. Yeah, some places it's like that. Some places it's even worse than that. <laughs> but yeah. in some places it's, it's like, you know, Things are so dynamic. Books are going out. People are becoming devotees. Pro programs are going on. Like last night, I did a program here in London, in South London. And uh, half the te temple was new people who came to learn about Krishna consciousness. It's a group that they've been cultivating. And these are all new people. And the program was very successful. They all got involved. They got involved in chanting and dancing and asking questions. And I met some interesting people who I guess one one is one man who came for the first time. He was dancing all over the all over the floor. It was his first time there. <laughs> he outdanced all the devotees. <laughs> Did he outdance you too, Marge? I was I was leading the kirtan. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> So he was, you know, so, you know, it's not like things are, had, has, have collapsed, you know, yeah. preaching is going on, yeah. programs are developing. I have another program tonight with some new people also. Wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's certain places that's, you know, some, like the summer world, some are happening, some are really, really booming. Sometimes I kind of miss the old days where we get so much, um, you know, um, help from seniors, so much help from, you know, devotees who really help us to see if we're going off track and we are trained to, you know, hear and accept it and pull out that weed that it's very, very subtle. Yeah, I mean, it's when we are a society and so we affect each other mm -hmm. but it's all based on good leadership when leadership is focused in the right way then everything happens nicely mm -hmm. so you're in the process of leadership and now you have to train people also to come up to a, a better standard through your example and through your preaching also mm -hmm. and by engaging them also on devotion. Thank you, Marj. I'm sorry, Marj, go ahead. Being a leader in Krishna consciousness means to be an example for what you're teaching and not sitting in the room with a computer and giving orders, you know. <laughs> yes, that is true, Marj. Yes. Marj, that's a question that I was sent uh, that was sent to me by Amrita Nam. She she's just having issues with her login with Zoom. So she's listening to uh, the, uh, the, the class through YouTube channel. And she said, um, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisance. So Sagrisha Shri Prabhupada, when we want to do quality chanting, we have to come to the state of peace. As soon as a wave of material disturbance comes, all this peace is scattered. 
how can we still not do offenseless chanting in such condition? Well, and Krishna says, whenever and wherever the mind wanders due to its unsteady and flickering nature, bring it back under the control of the self. Your mind wanders, bring it back to the sound. Bring it wanders again, bring it back again. Practice bringing the mind back to the, to the process of hearing. The mind will wander. It, it, it'll stop wandering when you reach a stage of, uh, of uh, pure chanting. Then it'll stop wandering. Now you have to bring it to that stage of pure chanting by bringing it back to the sound vibration. Here, listen carefully. I'm sure Amrita Nam is hearing it on YouTube and getting the answer, so that's good. She has just having issues connecting with Zoom. Any questions from devotees, please do raise your hand. This is such a important uh, topic and subject and point, you know, about the glories of chanting, how it really works on the heart and the mind. Marge, one question that, that I wanted to ask if you could um, elaborate on, Marge, is <clears throat> early on you were speaking about purification of the heart. And I think, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I think you said something where when we're chanting or when we're doing service, we should go into it, we should do it in the mood of purification for the heart. Yeah. What does that actually mean, Marge? Like, how can we, be, because, you know, for, for this crazy mind, purifying means, oh, I'm going to get cleaned up, I'm going to lose everything. So what does that actually mean, Marge? Like purification of the heart. That happens automatically when the chanting is is is, is proper. Chaito darpanam marjanam, first statement within the Shikshastakam prayers. Chanting cleanses the mirror of the mind, the mirror of the heart. So just work on the cause. In other words, we want to actually associate with Krishna through the chanting of the holy name. That's the process of, of uh, chanting, is to actually associate with Krishna through the chanting of the holy name. And that automatically pures the heart because when Krishna, you're associating with Krishna, it says, Srinvata Svakata Krishna Ponyas Ravan, he's cleansing your heart simply by his presence. <laughs> but you know, if we're chanting, we chant two, ra two, two uh, not two rounds, but two mantras of Japa, then our mind goes somewhere else. You, and then you bring it back and you chant a little bit, then you then it goes away again. You have to be somewhat very diligent in creating an atmosphere where you can chant more and more in a mood of attention. It's all about attentive chanting. You know, Marge, I was just thinking as you were speaking about that, how the mind you know, as you said, you know, we chant two mantras and the mind goes off and we're going to bring it back. It's like as if the, the mind has another head and face and mouth and you just got to tell that mind to shut up. It's such a frustration. <laughs> it's so much. When you start chanting, you're stirring up all of the thoughts within both the subtle and the gross part of the mind. And all of these things can rise to the top. You notice before your chant, you seem like you have control of the mind. As soon as you start chanting, and it becomes out of control. It's like you, when you try to t t tame a tiger. As soon as you try, he becomes more and more vicious. We sometimes would use the analogy of uh, taming a tiger. And so in the in the zoo, if they want to get a control of a, a lion or a tiger, they put him in a cage and then they don't feed him for one day. And if he doesn't get anything to eat for one day, he becomes more ferocious. And then 
you don't feed him the second day, he becomes even more ferocious. And then after some time, he, he can't become ferocious anymore because he's getting weaker and weaker and he becomes a big pussycat. <laughs> then that's how they control tigers. The minds like that don't feed it with material desires. <laughs> wow. Um, oh, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Marge. Sri Devi, please go ahead. Uh, one minute, Sri Devi. I'll be right back. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful analogy about the tiger. I have to remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Guru Maharaj has mentioned that uh, a few times, and it is very graphic, you know? Yes. The, the lion becomes more and more fierce and crashes around in the cage, and when, by the third day, he's absolutely loved. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Sri Devi. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, all glories to Prabhupada. As we were all discussing, Guru Maharaj, about the association of the devotees, then isolation, I was thinking about what if we purposely isolate because we are scared. Uh, we know all our anarthas will show up. We know that we have to rectify them. And maybe we are feeling so vulnerable that we don't want to expose ourselves just yet to all those mirrors that are going to show up. So is that a reason for isolating? And then if that is so, how can we overcome that? Maybe a, maybe a less conscious reason, but it is a reason. You may not be consciously aware. In terms of association, that's why Srila Prabhupada created the morning and evening programs at the temples. And this is where you get the essence of your association. So take advantage of these programs and, and then you get devotee association. And that devotee association is in relationship to the activities of the temple. And so everyone is engaged in the, in, in the same or similar ways. Yeah. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. That's a very nice question, Sridhi, because I have experienced that, you know, that that's this, yeah, yeah that I, that's this, um, different reasons, uh, you know, one don't know how to, you know, open up, one is fearful to open up, one is what if I'm being judged, like so many reasons, and then they isolate, and one is, okay, I'm just going to keep my stuff in the closet, and just look good outside. So many reasons, and and that used to, to I used to wonder that too, actually. Yeah. Yeah, by Guru Maharaj's mercy, I've been able to resume at least going to the temple since two days. So that's a big blessing for me. I, I hope little by little it'll pick up like that. Thank you. Did you take heed of that instruction I gave you? Yes, Guru Maharaj. I took it very seriously. By your mercy, I walked to the temple. And that has made a big difference since two days. You look much better. <laughs> Thank you. Even through, even through the, the Zoom, you look much better. <laughs> Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Continue. Thank you, Shadevi. Maya will challenge you. Once you start something, it's, it's easy to start something, but it's difficult to maintain something. We all get fired up about starting something or doing something more new and something beneficial. But then after some time, we lose our enthusiasm or something comes and interferes with that. Yeah. And Marge, is, is that something, and, and, and I've also seen that Marge, is that something because of the mind? Yeah. Yeah. It's the mind again. <laughs> this mind is such a headache, a rascal. <laughs> yeah, Sil Silpesh has given us the formula. Prabhupada said, I think Prabhupada was quoting his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta. Uh, he said, You should beat your mind with shoes in the morning and beat your mind with a broomstick at night. <laughs> so 
Prabhupada used to say, I carry a pair of shoes around with me. Anybody needs their mind beaten. <laughs> the mind's a rascal. Sometimes you can actually beat it, you know, just take a pair of shoes and just smash it a few times. It actually works. <laughs> but don't do it so too much where you get a headache or you cause some brain damage, you know. <laughs> that you don't want to do. There are people who, who get overly involved in that process, you know. <laughs> but it does work. <laughs> And if you can't do it, get, ask somebody to do it for you, you know. <laughs> Sri Devan, I like cracking up. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Somebody, somebody who loves you, of course. <laughs> Not just anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if somebody that don't like us much, they might probably might come to the stage of hospital visit. <laughs> but but I thought Guru Maharaj that actually means chanting the holy name, not literally like wow. picking the shoe and beating it on your head, but picking up your beads and chanting the holy name. It means both. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Bhakti Siddhanta was not just using a some kind of analogy, he was also saying, yeah. Prabhupada said, yeah, I carry a pair of shoes around with me for those who those who need it. <laughs> and Maj, you know, what what is coming to my mind is, you know, the mind is such a rascal, as you said, it of course is, you know, we were told. But at the same time, the you know, the the Lord is so merciful that He has given us such a simple process. You know, without all the other stuff that had to be done in the previous yukas, we got it so easy. But yet the mind is so, such a rascal that it makes it so difficult. It's, you well, know. The mind is very much affected by the age of Kali. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's very difficult for us to control the mind in this age because we talk about the... Uh, the weapons of mass distraction. And so many ways to get distracted. And they're always increasing too. And we have to be aware of that. And the best thing is strong sadhana in the morning. If you strengthen your sadhana, that will give you the foundation throughout the rest of the day to deal with all of the challenges that come by way of associating with this external energy. Marsh, will, will strong sadhana and chanting give us the desire to relish and quote unquote crave for devotee association, Maharaj? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. So can it be, uh, uh, can we say that that the reason I don't want, um, you know, don't have the strong desire or can't make the sacrifice or, you know, or whatever for devotee association is because my sadhana, my chanting is not strong? No, you're just in a rut, that's all. Mm. We, get, you, we get fixed in a particular routine and then we get stuck in it. Mm. sometimes the routine is beneficial and sometimes it's not or sometimes it's beneficial in one way when you see you get into that routine then you yeah. and, and 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 because we are comfortable in that routine we don't want to dis we don't want to disturb it because we are very comfortable and we just want it to go that way if you're if you're feeling satisfied in your practice of Krishna consciousness, then that's good. But if you're not feeling satisfied, and you feel like something is missing or you need more, then you reflect on what or what. Maybe it's maybe my sadhana is not strong enough. Maybe I'm not getting enough devotee association. Maybe I'm eating too much. 
Maybe I'm going to sleep too late at night. Maybe I'm getting up too late in the morning. Maybe I'm not reading Prabhupada's books. If you're if you're feeling satisfied in your Krishna consciousness, that's that it's an indication that you're 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 executing the process properly. And if you're not, then of course there's another element to that principle is that one should always be thinking how to make more advancement. Mm -hmm. mm. Again, it comes back to attentive chanting, mm -hmm. which is emphasized by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He said, here is where you can make progress. If you're thinking, how can I make progress in my spiritual life? He said, focus on increasing the quality of your chanting. A, a very good um, question, Marge. I, th I think that's a, a very good question for us to do a regular periodic uh, assessment on ourselves about how satisfied we, we are. And then that's really nice. Yep. Thank you, Marge. Yeah. Uh, what was, I was going to say something. Um, uh, chanting that is not satisfiable or what we say flickering and attentive chanting is like two different worlds experiences are completely on the opposite level one you're in your ears you're feeling so happy you want to continue chanting you think you know i don't want to do anything else and the other one is you can't wait to stop mm -hmm. So chanting can go from different experiences from one side of the universe to the other. Like a pendulum, one end to the other end. Wow. Thank you, Maharaj. Really nice uh, questions and answers for us to meditate on. And not only meditate, but also work and apply it to, to our lives. Thank you, Maharaj. Any other questions from devotees? Uh, yes, Prabhu, you can just turn on your, your speaker and ask a question. Go right ahead. Who's that? Manas Tiagi, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances all today, Shushi Raka Prabhu. Maharaj, uh, uh, when it comes to the advancement uh, in the spiritual life, uh, I have a very silly question, I believe, <laughs> uh, and that is like if I have uh, if I if I uh, if I get more time and I want to you know advance myself, what should I choose, uh, chanting or reading? Mm. You you get different answers from different people in that, depending on their particular inclination towards one or the other. Um, so many times reading really helps us in bringing quality to our chanting. Sometimes in order to increase the quality of our chanting or overcome whatever else, reading becomes very uh, fundamental and awakening the attachment to the process of Krishna consciousness. Because we read something, we hear something through the reading that really strikes us and inspires us to, to move forward and perform activities according to what we're reading. Like I'm reading now, I'm reading this book called Ayendra Kirtan Revolution. Uh, it's about the how he developed the whole process of kirtan, which is now spreading everywhere. Uh, so that's inspiring for me. And I'm only, I'm thinking, wow, yeah, let's do more kirtan. So you know, when you read about something, you're reading about the activities of devotional service. You're also reading about Krishna. So in many cases, reading will be a way to, again, jumpstart our Krishna consciousness or bring it to a better 
to a more acceptable level of practice. Others will say, just pick up your bees and chant. Prabhupada does say something. He says, when your enthusiasm is gone, somehow you lose all of your enthusiasm and you just don't feel enthusiastic about anything in devotional service. He says, sit down and just chant. And just keep chanting and chanting and chanting. And he says, and if you continue to do that, after some time, your enthusiasm will return. That's a statement by Prabhupada. Sure, Maharaj. In fact, that does happen with me. I mean, just to share, when I I, I, I feel really, you know, uh, distressed with this materialistic activities around me, I just start chanting and I feel so relieved. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, Maharaj. Thank you. Pure that was part. a nice question, Manas. Thank you. It helped all of us. Helped me, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Thank you, everyone. Any other question from devotees? Please do raise your hand or uh, drop a note, a question in the chat. I'm going down just to make sure that I don't miss anyone. If there isn't, Marsh, would you like to chant? Yes, got it. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> I was hoping you would ask. Yes, Maharaj. 